Hey everyone, how's it going? This is Tino, aka The Dirty Quantum. Welcome to another episode. Today we're going to do the genesis of Garch. So the reason why I created this episode was really uh, to, to sort of show that you can sort of fall into the trap of using the same tool, maybe the wrong tool, most, most likely, for every task, right? And this is mainly comes up look, when I see people using uh, correlations, people using, um, you know, standard deviation, essentially sa sample standard deviations, or, you know, regression, doesn't matter really what it is, right? But it's a tool that they've used that's uh, pretty, pretty basic, uh, which is, there's no problem with that, but it's maybe not the right tool for the job, right? And so what we're gonna look at is essentially, you know, volatility, you know, price return volatility, and look at how Garch really is uh, sort of born out of this, right? So uh, let's actually fire up a notebook and, uh, and see where we are. Beautiful, so here we are up and running, look, even if you don't know what Garch is, that's okay. Uh, hopefully this will be essentially a good introduction to it. Yeah, and really make you understand that, look, it's a tool like any anything else and it's not like you mustn't use it. Even though I am sometimes guilty of that, you don't have to use it in every occasion. There are a times and a place when it's suitable and hopefully we'll cover that. All right, so we're gonna start off. Uh, you know, this is a, a great quote I, I really enjoy. And if ever in doubt, uh, it's always Mark Twain. The quote's always from Mark Twain. Um, to someone with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. This is what I was talking about earlier. Yeah, if you've got a, a particular quant tool that you're familiar with, correlation, doesn't matter what, what it is, you're usually gonna use it all over the place, even though the assumptions might not be right. Um, so if you've got a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Pretty straightforward. So let's, let's, let's get stuck in and uh, download some data and have a bit of fun. All right, so just gonna use this little bit of code. Uh, let's actually zoom in to make your life a little bit easier. Whoa, turbo zoom. Don't forget to like, subscribe, you know the deal. So we're going to use this bit of code here to actually go to Wikipedia and get the membership of the S&P and then use Yahoo Finance to just get price data. Look, Yahoo Finance, it's fine just for, for price returns. A little bit of an issue with this is point in time index membership. We are looking at the members of the S&P as of today, um, even though we are looking at, you know, price series back in time. So it's not the membership and the time series it don't really add up. It doesn't matter. If you're doing something more like back testing, yes, you would have survivorship bias, but for for the purpose of this, it, it doesn't really matter. Great, so we've got 505, a few couple failed, doesn't really matter. Let's have a quick look what that looks like. So we've got the tickers across the top and the Sushi prices. Some of them have NAN just because they probably weren't around you know, 10 years ago. Uh, I mean, this would probably include like Tesla uh, in, the, in the membership as of today. Um, but obviously 10 years ago, there was no Tesla, maybe it wasn't traded or quoted. Anyway, cool. Just gonna take some, get some returns out of that. Pretty simple, just divided by the, uh, the offset and this is what the returns look like. So um, in this sort of scale where 1.5 means one and a half return, one and a half percent rather than 0 0.0 or 1.5, right? Um, we're gonna look at the cumulative returns. Maybe I always like to plot them. Did I do something wrong? Um, it, it happens to the best of us, right? So we're just gonna use this um, cumulative return, just the first 50, just to see if everything's looking good. And yeah, so we got, you know, whoever this A, B, M, D, you know, done very well. But you know, over the past 10 years, uh, this is the first 50 stocks. Yeah, it looks good, all right just crack on and let's have a quick look at just some high level characteristics so nothing too fancy yet just going to have a look at the daily mean so this essentially is the what's the average return every day so apple you know pretty amazing it's like yeah 12 13 basis points a day i mean obviously it's a big success story uh and then we're just going to have a look at some high level stats so you know total return annual return and just going to put it into a little data frame and just plot it. So these are the five highest returning stocks over the past 10 years in the index. So Netflix being the winner, averaging 45% a year. So um, pretty impressive, obviously. Uh, a couple of these, I don't really know what these tickers are, DPZ, but we're all, we're all familiar with Netflix. 
Uh, this is actually the, the lowest return. So, you know, APA um, hasn't done very well. So averaging 15% uh, a loss a year. So you know, not very good. So you can see there's a big dispersion here, right? Some stocks have done very well. Some stocks haven't done well at all. Um, but that's just the uh, finance world for you. Cool. So let's have a quick look at the daily return volatility for the stock. So this I'm just using STD sample standard deviations, nothing too fancy, right? So this is actually what it uh, looks like. This is on a daily basis. Most of the time, vol, you'll see it quoted on an annual basis. So it's a bit more of a like for like basis. What I like to do is just multiply it by 16 for familiarity. Why 16? Look, it's easy to do if you've got like a calculator with you or I don't know, whatever. Uh, it's just a square root of 256. Uh, most, some people do square root 252, 252 trading days. It's the same, same, right? It doesn't really matter. So just multiply by 16. These are the sort of numbers. So it's also quite relevant in the option world where you see sort of um, vol uh, quoted or you know implied vol um, quoted you'll sort of see it in this annual annual basis so it's a bit a bit more familiar all right so i'm just going to sort them and plot them so these are the stocks with the highest volatility so amd uh, maker of the cpu actually running on this uh, so go thread rippers um pretty high 58 percent vol i mean that's a huge number but same for netflix right 50%, 50% vol. I mean, the, you know, you can't expect 40 plus percent a year uh, return without a significant amount of risk. And you know, we can just say that vol is a proxy for, for that risk, right? And and who's got the lowest annual ret uh, annual vol? Um, a couple of these stocks down here, VZ, I'm guessing that's Verizon. Um, but yeah, pretty, uh, pretty low around that sort of 17%. That's sort of a flaw that you tend to see in vol. So, Quick one, do higher vault stocks compensate you uh, with higher returns, right? So this is sort of going back to sort of classical economic theory says, you know, higher risk, you should be compensated with a higher return. So is this so this is just a scatter plot of the two. Uh, and ideally, we should be seeing, seeing a line going up from you know bottom left where uh, lowest vol, so actually, um, lowest return uh, all the way up is a line there uh, I mean I don't know you know uh, you get these a uh, couple of these stocks you know they've got really high vol high risk you know 40 45 50 percent but some of them have returned you know actually negative return but some have returned positive overall there might be some sort of correlation but it's uh, it's, it's sort of hard to see right so pretty difficult all right so we're gonna get into the meat of this heteroscedastic volatility this is a bit of a scary word um really what is it? i'll show you really what does it mean right so looking at returns for a stock there's really two phenomena that we observe one is volatility clustering and that really means that you get periods of essentially a high risk so uh, 2020 year just gone we had you know march uh, corona really just sort of hit financial markets really quite hard and you get those concentrated periods where vol is actually quite elevated right so you get just a week or a few days of really high elevated vol and then sort of going back to normal we call that volatility clustering so essentially clusters into a little bunch and that's one phenomenon the other one is non-constant variance and this is really really quite key why i think that sample standard deviation uh, doesn't really work right so this will be very obvious in just a second so let's just take those returns for 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 netflix i'm just going to put a little plot right uh, these are uh, the uh, netflix daily returns so you obviously you've got some periods and where you've got a single day return, you know, 40%, but then another day we've got, you know, minus 30%. So this is where that uh, high vol number comes from. And the clustering I'm talking about is you get little little clusters. So, you know, a little period of nothing happening and then a little bunch of, you know, expanded big high, big, big highs, big lows. And that's really your clustering. Non-constant variance is essentially this. You get lots of peaks and troughs in these returns, right? So this is, um, you know, it is heteroscedastic, it is not homoscedastic. Let's have a look. I know, strange words, what do they mean? So let me get, this is just a distribution. Um, essentially, we get quite wild days. This is, what I'm gonna do is actually start to simulate some 
data based on the Netflix characteristics. So I've got a, um, a mean value for their returns uh, and I've got the standard deviation, right? So I've got those two once. I've once I've extracted those, I can just use the NumPy random non normal with the, the mean and standard deviation uh, with a certain length. And this is going to be my simulated return. So I've got on paper the same characteristics, same mean and same standard deviation, right? So you, know, you can sort of see what the simulated returns look like here. You get one day of 7%, one day of minus five. So pretty, pretty big numbers, right? So if we actually go ahead and plot this, this is Netflix. And this is the simulated series. You can really see where that uh, heteroscedastic and homoscedastic volatility comes in. I like to think of this, the simulated returns, right, as a sort of a big worm, right? So it's just a tube of, of returns. They have those sort of really just bounds and you don't get that clustering. Um, and it essentially is very flat. So this is homoscedastic volatility, right? If you are using sample standard deviation, you are making the assumption that this is what the data looks like. You're saying it's it's a tube, it's flat, the volatility doesn't change. With Netflix, it changes. You've got some days that, um, you know, really high vol, some periods of very high vol, some periods of not so high vol. Um, and I don't think it's the right tool. And look, just to prove that um, these two have the same, I'm just going to go and take those returns and actually just calculate the standard deviation. So Netflix is actually 51 and simulated 52. So an approximation. But you see, they do have the same uh, the same value, but they look totally different. So saying that this, you know, we're going to just use a single value to characterize this i don't think it's uh it's the best tool for the job again back to our dear friend mark twain if you are just if you've always been taught that you know you can just throw i mean dot std vol you know excel has it pretty much all financy quantity tools have standard deviation you're just going to get the wrong it's giving you the wrong impression because even if i go and use a simulator the data doesn't look anything like what the actual data look like, right? So one thing to keep in mind. Um, secondly, is there autocorrelation in returns? Um, what is autocorrelation? Autocorrelation means that the, the, the return of one day has an impact on the return for the next day, right? So if it were positively autocorrelated, if you had a really big return, so plus 10% one day, it's very likely statistically that you have um, a high return the next day, right, and so on and so forth, right. So, is there autocorrelation? So, we can use this um, this tool, this ACF, uh, which is an autocorrelation function, which tells us, you know, is is it present? So, I'm just going to pick a stock, um, BA. Let's just ignore the 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 warning. So, zero we always ignore. It's always one. Um, Monday's always correlated with Monday, right? Um, just because it's itself. And this essentially is the next day on average what it looks like. So it's actually pretty, um, pretty low. On average, it's sort of under 10%. So it's not too much. So what I'm going to do is just take all the returns, essentially rank them from top to bottom. So even the highest ranking one, uh, which is BA, which is actually probably why I chose that, um, only has, you know, very low sort of very low um, autocorrelation, right? First order autocorrelation, right? So just in the next day, predictive power. If anything, the majority of stocks have a negative autocorrelation, uh, which means if you get a high return one day, more likely it's actually gonna be the other way. So it's gonna pull back and um, actually be mean revert essentially, right? So just take this into consideration. So it's not really that obvious. And these numbers are not very big. I mean, minus 15% uh, isn't terribly big, right? But what about in the second moment, which is um, volatility? So is is it persistent there? So if we just have a look at the autocorrelation of squared return, this is sort of a good proxy um, for volatility. Well, you know, already that number's jumped to to 40, you know, plus, you know, above 40%. And it's the same stock, uh, BA over here, right? Boeing. And if I do, if I actually rank all of them by the, you know, the autocorrelation of the squared return, 
you can see they're actually all pretty, pretty high. I mean, you know, I mean, even, I mean, the lowest is uh, you know, down here, but they must have some very particular issues. I'm not going to investigate them why they're so low, but the, you know, there's a, quite a bulk of them that have a really high, uh, high number. This is what we were observing in essentially Netflix, that um, bunching of volatility. So this is the characteristic that I'm talking about here, volatility clustering that high positive autocorrelation value for volatility results in vol being elevated. You have a big shock, big news on Monday, you're gonna get big shocks throughout the week. Whether that be positive or negative, we don't know. That's um, this first chart should tell you that it's inconclusive, but in terms of volatility, yes, you're going to get uh, essentially a big, um, a big wild week, right? So cool, so what do we do? what do we how do we model this how do we put a number to this so there are what's called conditional volatility models right conditional volatility means that the volatility it's conditional on the time so it, it matters when we are looking at it right all right so what do we do about this we can use something called GARCH, which stands for generalized autoregressive conditional heteroscedastic model so the autoregressive is what we talked about here where um, the volatility on one day influences the volatility the next day, so it's autoregressive on itself. Uh, conditional is that time period, so it matters when we are looking at this. And heteroscedastic, it's saying that volatility is not flat. Vol it's it's not homoscedastic. It's not that sort of that worm I was talking about with uh, with that simulated data. It does vary up and down. So it's saying volatility is non non constant. We can use the arch model, it's already sort of uh, inbuilt, you can just sort of pip install arch and um, have a look at that. I actually prefer building some of these things myself, but for the sort of convenience, it's very good. If you're just starting out, you can just sort of chuck stuff in there and we go. So pretty straightforward, I'm just gonna use uh, the returns for Apple and you can just sort of use different different distributions. Um, I mean, to your heart's content, there is a whole world, a plethora of uh, different Garch models. Um, we're just gonna stay with sort of basic Garch, one, one um, distribution, do a T, makes it a little bit more interesting, student T rather than just sort of normal. And um, we get this sort of output. It runs pretty, really, really fast, right? So uh, the bits that we're interested in is sort of actually these values here, the uh, omega, alpha, and betas. Uh, new is the coefficient of that student T. So four, you know, so it's really pushing the boundary. So I think the, the lower bound is actually four. So maybe it's saying, well, we maybe might want to use a different uh, distribution, but uh, we'll look at that another time. Um, and maybe even just, instead of just looking at this output, let's actually look at what this looks like, what this uh, conditional volatility look like. So basing, uh, using these uh, these uh, coefficients here can actually take the returns and it will actually give me a value, actually a prediction for the next day and so on and so forth. So this is essentially what uh, what it looks like. And this is this is the you know conditional volatility that Garch spits out. Um, you know, pretty interesting. He's got these sort of periods of you know high and uh, and, and, and low values, and um, you know we can essentially if we compare that to what a oh, unconditional variance, if you want to use the same sort of language compared to conditional. So sample standard deviation is unconditional, right? We're not. We're just saying it's it's flat. It's going to be. It, it, we're not taking time into consideration. It's essentially like an average of that, right? So you could have a period like here. What's this? Uh, late 2018, where you know vol was actually quite elevated for some time, and you know you wouldn't be using that line as a characteristic wouldn't be correct because the vol at that time was actually a lot higher. For, for months, months on end, and especially here, early 2020, March, you know, vol for, or conditional vol for Apple absolutely exploded, right? So it's really not, so not, it's not appropriate to use a single number, right? So look, I understand the the benefit of using a single number, it's just, it's a value you can use, it's, it's simple, uh, it's easy to understand, right? But I don't think it gives a full picture so yeah, um, single line, maybe not so good. So what's the alternative? Um, you know, if you say, look, I don't want a full 
fledged gotch. Um, you know, there are sort of intermediary things that you can do. One is sort of using like a rolling um, volatility, weighted, which is, I guess, what a gotch model is, but something like this where you say, okay, look, I'm just gonna take uh, 22 days, so a month, I'm just gonna roll it, get a single value and, uh, you know, roll it on, uh, move it on each day. And you get something like this, which is, you know, it's cool. It, get, it captures um, periods of higher and low, lower value. Um, this is a, actually a really perfect example and it wasn't planned like this. Um, why I don't like using, you see you get this real harsh um, increase and then a real sharp decrease. And the reason why that is because you would have had um, a real big day and, and when it gets included in the sample, it sort of goes up and the moment it rolls off when it becomes day 23, essentially it uh, doesn't get included anymore and you get back down the cliff. So that's one of the reasons, but look, it's it's simple enough. Um, but look, you've done all this work, why not just use Garch, right? Where, I mean, it would still have that a bit, um, bit of that spike, but um, it would be, because it's sort of like a waiting scheme, it would just be that little bit flatter, that little bit smoother, right? Um, this is what the actually the Garch model of that looks like comparing the two. Let's actually go on that little cliff. And yeah, and look, this is what, what Garch does. So it does include it, but it's just, I don't know, it's just that little bit smoother, right? Um, you know, if one day you went from, was this 11 to 35? Oh yeah, fine, it's a new regime. And then back down to 11, you'd think something really, really quite strange was, uh, was happening. So comparing the two obviously at this sort of high level they don't look too different but i guess the devil is uh, is in the detail right cool i like using sort of you know, simulated data for essentially for this rolling window this makes it even more obvious but look i think this um this actual real life example was actually perfect let's say i have got a data that looks like this right so this is just simulated time series doesn't really matter i just made it up Cool, so all I'm gonna do is include a single real, um, a single day, which is like, you know, really, really high. So many orders of magnitude higher than um, than everything else, right? So you've got that single value. If I were just to use um, a, a rolling standard deviation, you know, this is what I would get. So you still get that cliff, that would, which I was talking about, when that day gets included and the day it doesn't get included, it drops off. People say, well, you know, I can use exponentially weighted or um, um, exponentially weighted standard deviation, whatever, which is you know, broadly speaking, what sort of Garch is, fine. Um, you get something like this, right? Where, you know, it still doesn't solve the problem. Well, would Garch fit it? You know, let's see, would Garch solve the problem? Let's, uh, let's have a look, right? If I fit that, I get something like this, look, I'm familiar with this output. I actually know what I'm looking for and I can tell, okay, something really, really weird is happening. But if you just have to look for one thing uh, out of all of this output, look for this value here, the beta, all right? That's actually your memory. It should be something in the 80, 90, 0 0.8, 0 0.9 sort of region. Um, something like this, something is uh, clearly amiss. I mean, these p-values, something's clearly wrong there. But you know, if I had to just pick one thing, I would look at that. What does it look like? Um, does it even plot? I mean, it's, it's just a complete mess. It's not the right tool for the job. Back to our dear friend, uh, Mark Twain. There's other things I want to cover, uh, copulus, DCC, uh, which is dynamic conditional correlations, etc. Et but I think for just one video, this is essentially plenty to sort of go on. I'll, I'll tack that on as, a, as, an, as another video because they sort of do progress, right? There is, uh, it's in the right, uh, right sort of sphere where using the right tools for the jobs and, you know, little nuances. So hope you found this, uh, this video useful and uh, I'll catch you in the next one. Cheers. Bye.